I need to keep you awake because it's pretty late, so I'm going to show a lot of pictures and videos and no science. So it should be lots of fun. And I usually start this uh, presentation trying to ask a question like, where is this area in the background? But I don't know the percentage of Italians in the room. It's pretty high, so I'm not to, going to ask this question. And maybe some of you know that this is Malta, and this one is Sicily. And this is kind of a simulation at 300 meters that shows winds and clouds. And that's what this typical situation that we expect to, to find here. That's why most of the people go here on vacations, right? That's just a few clouds, not a lot of winds. But actually, the Mediterranean, it's, there's a lot of things that are happening. And there are also a lot of cyclones. And also, there are particular cyclones that we call tropical life because they show features that are similar to tropical structures. And that's what I'm showing you in these slides. I'm comparing Eric and Floyd of the 1990s and, uh, uh, let's say, this tropical-like cyclone over the Mediterranean. And you can see there are many similarities between the two. You can see an eye in the middle, this spiraling distributed cloud bands. But one of the main differences that maybe you cannot tell from this picture is, of course, the size. Mediterranean is not the same as the Atlantic, so these systems cannot grow as much as this. And that's why there is basically, uh, in this case, we are on the order of thousands of kilometers, while in the other case, we are on the order of 100 kilometers. And that is just one of the main differences between these two structures. And throughout this presentation, I want to just discuss one of these tropical-like case, which was called kind of in a weird name. So it's, it's weird because in mean, Mediterranean, there is no official climatology of these events. So the only institute that gives name to these events is basically the University of Berlin. And they call this scale Kindreza, believe it or not. And this is the satellite picture that shows kind of this high. And there is where is Malta. And now I'm overlying kind of a trajectory, observer trajectory of this system. And you can see it was kind of weird. It was born here. Then it went over some island here, over Malta. And then it did this kind of weird loop over Sicily, which is here in this upper corner. And from the radar animation in Sicily, you can clearly see that this is really a tropical structure. You can see an eye, and you can see precipitation around the eye. So we are really talking about a tropical structures. And even more to this, if you look at observations in two different points, so there is an island here. You cannot see it, but there is an island, trust me. And over Malta, you can see the drop in pressure in both stations. And we're talking about 1,000 hectopascal to 980. So it's kind of a really strong drop in just a few hours. And also winds goes up to 100, 150 kilometers per hour. And, but you can see that inside the eye, there is calm. So this is really a tropical structure. This case was not just interesting because of these observational features, but also how the way we try to predict this cyclone. And this is, again, this observer trajectory that I was showing you before. And now I'm going to show you the forecast of the operational model at that time. We start from GFS. And what you can see is that it's not that bad in the first phase, although the timing is not perfect. But then it completely misses this uh, landfall over Sicily. So let's trust more the European. And let's uh, look at ASNWF. And it's even worse. Weirdly enough, <laughs> and you can see that it goes too quickly over Sicily. And then as a consequence of this, at some point, it just goes south. And this, you can say, whatever, we are talking about 10 kilometers, like not even 100 kilometers here. Yeah? But it's kind of hard to tell to these people that they're expecting these strong winds and rainfall if the model is telling something like that. And this, this is kind of a typical problem in predicting this cyclone, because in this case, we're talking about scales of 100 kilometers. So you really need a model, an initial condition that can describe this phenomenon. And so what the question that I had in mind is actually looking at this case is, is resolution really important to predict these events? And we can actually try to understand whether there is the threshold that we need to take into account if we want to simulate these events. And in order to do that, I use not WORF, but ICON. Uh, which is a model that is used uh, in Germany by the National Weather Services. I'm not going to put millions of points with all the details of my configuration, because I don't think it is important. But I think this important part is that you can see the domain there on the right part. But I've tried to span different uh, resolutions. So starting from 10 kilometers, so something that 
kind of uh, resemble the analysis that you're forcing the model with, going to up to 300 meters over this small domain that you can see here. And of course, the configuration of the model are slightly different, uh, especially to the turbulence parameterization and the convection parameterization. But what I wanted to see is actually what was changing when I was just changing resolution, forcing with the same data. And so we're, we we're looking into, at first, uh, the trajectory of this cyclone. Here again, I'm going to guide you through this picture. This black line and points is the observed one. And these two color lines are these first two cases at 10 kilometers and 5 kilometers. And the color shows the intensi intensity. But you can see in this case, if you remember the trajectory that we were showing you before, that it doesn't really do a good job. It, it goes too early over Sicily. And then uh, basically, the, the cyclone just dies off and just stays there. And that is not surprising, because we are forcing this data with Eastern WF, which had the same bias. But what happens if we go even further in resolution? Well, everything changes. Again, I'm forcing with the same data here. But you can see already from the color that it's completely changing, because here we're talking about completely different intensity. So we are starting from a storm, which is way more intense than before. And we are getting kind of the trajectory right in the first part. But also here, we see this kind of loop that it's appearing in the trajectory. And this is pretty surprising, because if we go to 300 meters, it's even better. So if you look at the right part where you see just a blow up of this area over Sicily, you can see that the trajectory of the 300 meters, which is this crosses, it really goes over the upper servant one. So you can clearly see that it's an in increasing forecast skill just with increasing resolution. And the data that are forcing the simulation are really in the same. And I think this sums up in this phrase that when you're able to explicitly represent convection, so here I'm talking not about convection permitting, but really convection explicit, then the trajectory of this cyclone really converges to the one that was observed. And it's just not just the trajectory. You can look at how the storm really looks like in the simulation. And here I'm showing you the video. So take the popcorn and let's look into this. So this is basically a 3D volume presentation of clouds. And underneath, you can see the winds. You can see the storm that is spinning up. And then you start to see the high. At some point, it goes over Malta. And then we see, of course, that we show in this uh, trajectory this deviation over Sicily. And then it just stays there. Is, there is, there's a really high mountain here. So you can see the clouds that are forming over the mountains. And at that point, this storm is not a tropical storm anymore. So it just ties off and it goes away from the domain. But you can still see like how the size of the clouds is in the simulation. You can really resolve individual clouds and also individual cold pools. And the next is just a quick look at the structure at just one time step. These are basically the winds colored by intensity. And you can clearly see there are intense winds on the southern flank. And in the middle, you see these winds that are basically going to zero. Because if you look through the, the storm, you basically have this calm in the center of the storm. This basically to, to give you an idea of how realistic the, the, the storm will look in the simulation. But for now, there's nothing about physics. I'm just talking about the simulation, which, of course, it's nice to, to show, but it's nothing really physical. So next step would be to understand why. Why is this happening? It's just not, OK, our resolution is better. It's not kind of a good motivation. Uh, so the way I've done that, I try to see how the structure of this storm changes with resolution. And the way I've done this is basically to track the cyclone and look how the structure is in every point, at every time step. And this is what I'm comparing here. So you have to think every circle here is a circle around the cyclone, so center on the cyclone position. And the color just show the temperature anomaly with respect to average over this circle. So it basically shows you, and is the, te the temperature close to the surface. So it basically shows you how, where warm air is. And we start from the left to this 5 kilometer resolution. You can see there is kind of some hint of a warm core, but it's not really strong. Well, if we go already to the 1 kilometer, we can see that the anomaly is up to 3 Kelvin. So you can really see uh, this warm core in the middle of the storm. And if you go to the 300 meter resolution, this this core, it's, I think it's even larger. So it looks like the storm, it's, it's getting even larger. And so what means that basically convection permitting simulation here, I'm making the distinction between convection permitting and convection explicit, do not produce a warm core as a result of not, having, not being able to explicitly represent convection. And this is not just important from the local scale, because this goes on to the, to the large scale. Because I know that there was someone talking about this, I think, yesterday. 
when you have deep convection, you also have release of latent heat. And when you have a release of latent heat, you know, which would be here schematized by this red line, you also have this dipole in potential vorticity, which I'm schematizing here to this purple line. And this can actually affect the large scale. And to see that, you can basically, again, track the cyclone and just look how potential vorticity looks like around the cyclone. And that's what I'm showing in this uh, um, height time plot. Uh, here is basically every time step of, of the cyclone position that I'm averaging around the cyclone. And you can see the vertical structure of potential vorticity. What you see is that is interesting is that you see this production of PV in the lower levels, which is basically related to this uh, really strong heating. And you get this maximum. And then around this, you get this depletion of potential vorticity because it's related, again, to this dipole in potential vorticity. If you go even higher up, you, see, you start to see kind of the large scale structure of PV, which is related more to a potential vorticity streamer. What happens if we go to, this is the one kilometer uh, simulation. What happens if we go to 10 kilometers? Surprise, the thing, the, the thing in the lower levels completely disappear. And that makes sense because in this case that we saw before, we don't have a warm core. So we basically don't have this release a lot in teeth. And as a result of this, we don't have any potential vorticity maximum in the lower levels. But this does, just doesn't affect here the lower levels because if we don't have a maximum, we also don't have this dipole, which means that also the depletion in this level, it will be affected. And you can kind of see it here because it looks like the, the values in the are getting the, of potential vorticity are getting like more like down to 300 to 350 hectopascal. But you can also do the same simulation at one kilometer where you prevent the release of latent heat and you kind of get the same results. So I think this is really interesting because it shows how you can get a feedback that goes from the small scale to the large scale. And which you also see in this last slide that I'm showing. And this is instead of looking like just say at every position of the cyclone, you can more at the 2D, 3D structure. I just put in with the color shading the geopotential light just to have an idea of where the cyclone is. And then these uh, awful uh, black lines are basically potential vorticity just at one level. And I'm comparing the one kilometer and 10 kilometer resolution simulations. And you can see that in this case, there are a lot of maxima close to the second center, even though we are higher levels. Because of course, there's no production of potential vorticity, which means there is also no depletion in the higher levels. In this case, instead, the maximum of kind of around the cyclone, but they don't stay over the cyclone. And so just changing the resolution, you can basically affect the, the large scale state. And as a result of this, you will have a complete different evolution over time. And yeah, that's basically what I've said. And I think the, what, we, what we get from that is that we are trying, with models, I think we are trying to reproduce something that looks like this. But unfortunately, and we have to admit that, clouds in our models, they look like this. And it's kind of depressing trying, I mean, trying to get some results of all this. So we can make the boxes smaller as we can, but we are still left with boxes. Or in Icon, actually, it's triangles. But I mean, that's, that's the point of this. And what, what does this mean? It means that we are trying to reproduce a situation that looks like this. So we have kind of a latent heat release that it should look something like this. But we are left with our box, which maybe has a, like a reasonable latent heat profile that looks something like this. And this, I, show you, I, I kind of show you that this actually propagates to the large scale. And as a result of this, you have an evolution which looks completely different. And if that was not confusing, I can take questions. Thank you.